Hello and welcome to this lecture on High Renaissance. We continue the story that we began in the previous lecture with the rebirth era of art. In the High Renaissance, we see it is from where the period, the previous period stopped, so from the 1490s to the early next following century, 1527. And the High Renaissance is the artistic pinnacle of the Renaissance. The period is exemplified by the groundbreaking iconic works of art being made in Italy during what was considered a thriving societal prime. Artists were keenly interested in anatomy, science and architecture, and that all bled through into their artwork. Key ideas from the High Renaissance was the concept of the Renaissance man. It was epitomized by men like Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael, and Donato Bramante. Artists move away from this idealized religious iconography in their work, and instead they focus on subject matter of divine subjects they are which are infused with a more resonant and human emotionality and expression. High Renaissance artists perfected techniques borrowed from early Renaissance artists. This included the use of linear perspective to create extreme depth, highly accurate and scientifically correct depictions of human anatomy, the foreshortening of figures and subjects within elevated paintings and sculptures to provide an authentic viewing experience from below, and trompe-l'oeil effects to seamlessly incorporate architectural elements into a work of art. We see new groundbreaking styles like sfumato, Leonardo da Vinci created sfumato, a glazing effect that revolutionized the blending of tone and color. And we see the style of quadratura or ceiling paintings. They were meant to rapturously draw the gaze of viewers up into a heavenly visage. And there's a strong emphasis on beauty. High Renaissance artists' key concerns were to present pieces of visual, symmetrical and compositional perfection. High Renaissance artists were influenced by the linear perspective, shading and naturalistic figurative treatment launched by early Renaissance artists like Masaccio and Mantegna. But they mastered those techniques in order to convey a new aesthetic ideal that primarily valued beauty. The human figure was seen as embodying the divine and new techniques like oil painting were employed to convey human movement and psychological depth in gradations of tone and color. Drawing upon the classical Greek and Roman proportional preciseness in architecture and anatomical correctness in the body, masters like Leonardo, Michelangelo and Raphael created powerful compositions where the parts of their subjects were illustrated as harmonious and cohesive with the whole. It all began with Leonardo da Vinci. The High Renaissance began with the works of da Vinci as his paintings, The Virgin of the Rocks from 1483 to 85 and The Last Supper from the 1490s exemplified psychological complexity, the use of perspective for dramatic focus, symbolism and scientifically accurate detail. However, 
Both works were created in Milan, and it wasn't until 1500 when da Vinci moved back to Florence, the thriving center of art and culture, that his work impacted the city. His study for the Virgin and Child with St. Anne from around 1499 to 1500 was displayed at Santissimi Annunziata Church, where many artists went to study it. Leonardo's scientific understanding and observation of natural phenomena and his sense of mathematical proportion were also profoundly influential. His ink drawing, Vitruvian Man from 1490, showed ideal human proportions correlating with ideal architectural proportions advanced by the Roman architect Vitruvius in his De Architectura from around the year 30 to 15 BCE. The drawing is occupied by da Vinci's writing that illustrates his deep scientific inquiries into anatomy, as for example, the length of the outspread arms is equal to the height of a man. Leonardo was not only a noted painter, but also a polymath who has been called the father of architecture, ecnology, and paleontology, among other fields. He was a noted inventor, cartographer, engineer, and his findings and observations, recorded in his notebooks, found their way into various collections, called the Codex Arundel from 1480 to 1518, and Codex Leicester from around 1510, among others. To some, these notebooks have become as valued as his artworks. Let's look at da Vinci's fresco, The Last Supper, dating from around the 1490s. As I said, it is a fresco in the convent of Santa Maria delle Grazie in Milan. Duke Ludovico Sforza commissioned the painting for the convent of Santa Maria delle Grazie, monastery's refectory, and the artist created it so that Christ and his disciples seemed to be an extension of the space where the monks ate dinner. By using Italian models for his disciples, depicting a Tuscan landscape, and including a plate of orange slices and grilled eel, a popular dish at the time, he brought ordinary elements that the monks would recognize into the famous religious scene. The artist's radical experimentation with media can also be seen. To achieve an effect like oil painting, Leonardo used oil and tempera to paint on a dry wall, after first applying plaster and then adding an underlying layer of white pigment to increase the vibrancy of the colors. The theme of the painting is the Last Supper. This is the moment, the last moment that Jesus has with his 12 disciples. It depicts the moment when Christ said, Verily I say unto you that one of you will betray me. It was before they knew it was going to be Judas. And this is the moment that they speculate among themselves who will be the traitor. You can see um, Judas is already depicted as separate from the group and not part of the group. It shows the shocked expressions of the disciples. How could anyone think of betraying Jesus? And it uses linear perspectives. All lines converge to focus on the central figure of the painting, Jesus Christ. The windows behind Christ also are used as an element to frame him and highlight him. 
instead of using the traditional religious iconography of the halo, this frame with this light landscape background um, creates the same type of illumination. Within the first few decades, the paint started to deteriorate because it was an experimental method. And other events have also damaged the work greatly. You can see from this slide on the right, a protective structure was built in front of the fresco during the Second World War in an attempt to try and protect it. And at the bottom of the slide, it shows what the fresco looked like in the 1970s before it was restored. Let's look at a second painting by Leonardo da Vinci. It's Salvatore Mundi from around the year 1500. It shows Jesus Christ in contemporary Renaissance dress. It clearly shows this humanist influence in the artwork, um, but he's still depicted as a savior of the world and master of the cosmos. His right hand is making the sign of the cross and his left hand holds a crystalline sphere representing the heavens. It is a half-length portrait, which was a radical departure from full-length portraits of the time. He uses the sfumato technique here, the softness of the gaze, which is acquired through sfumato, lends a spiritual quality, inviting veneration from the viewer. It is as though the figure appears in front of you. You struggle to actually see the brush strokes. He also depicts Jesus Christ with a frontal gaze. This extreme realism of the face encompasses an emotionality and expressiveness defined by the artist's acuity with anatomical correctness. And just to give a clearer picture of the artworks of Leonardo da Vinci, some more of his works. The High Renaissance was dominated by a few celebrated masters and the competitive rivalries that developed between them as they vied not only for noble patronage but also for supreme excellence in their art. A notable rivalry was that of Leonardo da Vinci versus Michelangelo, the younger artist in this case. In 1504, they were um, participating for competing frescoes that were commissioned for opposing walls in the Hall of the 500. Unfortunately, the frescoes were never completed, but drawings of the studies for those frescoes have remained. You can see on the left the study of a male back for the Battle of Cassina. And da Vinci's interpretation shows two warriors' heads for the Battle of Anghiari. Pope Julius II reigned from 1503 to 1513, during the height of the High Renaissance era. He was an avid art collector. He owned the Lao Kun, and the Apollo Belvedere, which were ancient classical texts. 
He wanted to make Rome the art center of Europe instead of Florence. He persuaded Raphael to move to Rome to paint the frescoes of the Vatican's papal apartments. He commissioned Michelangelo to create the papal tomb and he convinced the, the sculptor to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. The Pope's ambition to rebuild St. Peter's Basilica and redesign the Vatican led him to recruit Bramante, Michelangelo and Raphael into roles as architects of his grand plans. After Julius II's death, papal patronage of the arts continued under Pope Leo X, the son of Lorenzo de' Medici, patriarch of the ruling and art-loving family of Florence. In the normal course of events, many men and women are born with remarkable talents, but occasionally, in a way that transcends nature, a single person is marvelously endowed by heaven with beauty, grace and talent in such abundance that he leaves other men far behind. All his actions seem inspired and indeed everything he does clearly comes from God rather than from human skill. This quote is from the Lives of the Artists from 1568, written by Vasari. This standard not only dominated the period, but also the perception of artistic ability, positioning the artist as a divinely inspired genius. The term Renaissance man is still used today to describe a well-rounded and multi-talented person who exhibits mastery in a wide array of intellectual and cultural pursuits. Some painting innovations during the High Renaissance include Michelangelo designed a scaffolding system to reach the roof of the Sistine Chapel for his fresco. He developed a new formula and application for fresco to counter the problem of mold, as well as a wash technique and the use of a variety of brushes to first apply color, then later add fine detail, shading and line. For his Last Supper of the 1490s, Leonardo da Vinci experimented by working on dry fresco and used a combination of oil and tempera to achieve an oil painting effect. Another innovation was trompe-l'oeil, a technique by which to achieve the illusion of a pictorial space that integrates into its surrounding architectural environment. They also experimented with painting with oil on wood and da Vinci developed this fumato technique, which is Italian for vanished gradually like smoke. It really was difficult to nearly impossible to see the brush strokes and that was the intent of the technique. Quadratura is a term used for the burgeoning ceiling paintings genre of the time. It unified with the surrounding architecture and was known for the employment of trompe l'oeil. It required visual spatial skill and a masterful employment of linear perspective. The use of quadratura was used often in Catholic churches to produce an awe-inspiring effect which was in direct opposition to the movement toward Protestantism that would later become the Reformation. Prospettiva Melozziana, or Melozzo's perspective, was developed by Melozzo da Forli, an Italian artist and architect. It is foreshortening of bodies and objects so that they appeared authentic when seen from below. 
Let's look at architecture from this time. Donato Bramante was the leader in high Renaissance architecture. His designs emphasize classical harmony, employment of a central plan, and rotational symmetry as seen in his Tempietto from 1502. Tempietto is Italian for small temple. It dates from the year about 1502 and it is in Rome, Italy. It's located in the courtyard of the Church of San Pietro. The round temple consists of a single chamber inspired by Bramante's knowledge of classical buildings such as the Pantheon and the Temple of Vesta from the 3rd century. And the Pantheon is from around the year 113 to 125 AD. There are many Greek and Roman references in his architecture. He developed the Tuscanic column, or Tuscany column. It's a variant of the Doric column. The Tempietto has 16 of these columns that ring the building. He used a simpler round base, and in its proportions, it followed the ratios of the Ionic column. An entablature above the columns depicts the keys of St. Peter and elements of the Catholic Mass. The balustrade encircles the hemispheric dome, meant to symbolize the heavenly vault and the universe. Bramante wanted to create a building that was a perfect fusion of humanist beliefs derived from the classical world and Christian faith, as shown in the circular building's resemblance of both a Greek temple and the circular form traditionally used in tombs for Christian martyrs. He utilized mathematical proportions derived from da Vinci's study of the Roman architect Vitruvius and his application of those proportions to the human body as seen in his human figure in a circle and square illustrating Vitruvius on proportion from 1485 to 90 which Bramante studied when working with Leonardo for the Duke of Milan. The Tempietto is also called the Jewel of the Renaissance. Bramante also created the first trompe l'oeil effect for architectural purposes at the Church of Santa Maria Presso San Satiro in Milan. Due to the presence of a road behind the wall of the church, only three feet remained for the choir area. So the architect used a linear perspective and painting to create an illusionary sense of expanded space. Michelangelo was Bramante's chief rival, as in later life he worked as an architect. He designed the Laurentian Library in Florence and created the dome for St. Peter's Basilica. Though the building as a whole reflected the work of Bramante, Raphael and later architects like Bernini. This work, which took place between 1523 to 71, was particularly innovative, creating a dynamic sense of movement in the staircase and wall features that was influential upon later architects. In terms of high Renaissance sculpture, our leading man was definitely Michelangelo. He was known for his use of monumentality. He loved huge works, size and scale, to impress everybody who looked or encountered the sculpture pieces. His innovations include the reintroduction of marble instead of bronze as the choice of medium to work with, such as, for example, his David and the Pieta.
Let's take a closer look at Michelangelo's David from 1501 to 1504. Its size is huge in scale. It's um, nearly two meters high. It's 199 centimeters high by 517 centimeters. It shows the hero David from the Old Testament as he faces the giant Goliath. It evokes classical Greek sculpture. This work was the first time since the classical era that the male nude has been carved in a work of marble and to this size. Depart from the usual depictions of um, David or David. Um, it shows the moment before his victory. It shows large eyes and prominent brow conveying concern. Um, he turns to assess the danger. He's got only a slingshot slung across his shoulder, and that is the only thing that is able to identify him as the biblical hero. And there is a deliberate foreshortening. You can see the hands are bigger in size than the feet, and that is because people were going to look at it from below and up. So Michelangelo wanted the proportions to remain intact. The statue the optical proportions, sorry, to remain intact. The statue was originally intended to stand on the base of Brunelleschi's dome of the Florence Cathedral, causing it to be viewed from below on an elevated position, and that the artist created these tweaks in regards to that particular perspective. The viewer was meant to circle the work, is an outward motion from a central core forces the viewer to take into account both the form and the space between and surrounding the forms in order to appreciate the complete composition. This photograph shows the original David outside the Palazzo Vecchio before it was moved in 1873. The sculpture was then still clothed with the loin covering added by the 16th century city officials for propriety's sake. The second work of Michelangelo that we are going to look at is his very famous Pieta from around 1498 to 1499. It is 195 centimeters in height and its width is around 174 centimeters. The statue was commissioned for the French Cardinal Jean de Belier as part of his funeral monument, but it got moved to St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. It's the only work of Michelangelo that he ever signed. Pieta means pity, and it usually, in artworks, shows the moment that the earthly mother Mary holds her deceased son, Jesus, after he was crucified. The sculpture fo follows a pyramid structure, and Mary's head forms the vertex of that pyramid. The figures are, once again, out of proportion. Much of Mary's body is concealed by drapery to make space for full-grown man, this Jesus, to be able to fit on her lap. But also there's a naturalness of flesh depicted masterfully in marble. It shows a young Mary, not the historical Mary, which at that time would have been about 50 years old. Um, Michelangelo said in response to, to many people who said, but this Mary is too young to be the mother. He said, chaste women stay fresher longer, so much more the virgin. But um, 
it does the pieta traditionally depicts a very painful moment the moment that a mother realizes that her son is dead but it, again there is a greek reference to the sculpture because mary's face is not in agony but her face is serene and to create a clearer picture of the sculpt the sculpture works of Michelangelo. Let's look at more examples of his works. Another artist of the High Renaissance period is Raphael. <clears throat> 